right, welcome to the second video in the Unit 1 Chemistry of Life. Um, so this video is going to be covering Elements of Life and Intro to Macromolecules, which is sections 1.2 and 1.3. So to get started of looking at how the very small impacts the very large, let's take a look at this diagram looking at structural organization. So the very smallest scale is atoms. That then builds into molecules, which builds into cells and tissues, organs, systems, and finally organism level. So to understand the importance of atoms, let's do a little thought experiment. What if an organism no longer had access to one of the atoms that makes up the molecule of DNA. So if we were missing some critical part of DNA, our cells would no longer be able to divide. So the process of mitosis is really critical in terms of both growth and repair of our cells. So missing one critical atom would impact a molecule which would impact the cell. If we can't go through that mitosis process, we're going to have problems then that go on to the tissue level, organ level, system level, and organism level. So missing even just one uh, type of atom has huge implications on um, our lives as organisms and other organisms. So now that we understand the relationship between the very small and the very big, let's keep our focus on the fairly small and talk about macromolecules. So the word, root word macro means large. So macromolecules are large molecules. Um, another name that we sometimes will use is biomolecules. So there are four very common um, biomolecules that you need to be familiar with. You also need to know what elements um, are in them and what their component parts are. So what are their building blocks? What are the little pieces that make up those bigger macromolecules? You should know some examples of each of these macromolecules and their function. So take a moment right now and see what you remember about these macromolecules. So the four macromolecules are carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. Here's some illustrations brought to you by Amoeba Sisters, uh, little cartoon versions of each of these that I think do a good job of showing the general structure of those monomers, those component parts. So it's important to know what atoms are in each of these macromolecules. In carbohydrates, we have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. In protein, we have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur. Uh, we'll talk more about sulfur's role um, when we talk about proteins in more detail. In lipids, we always have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Some lipids also include phosphorus. Nucleic acids include carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. So you can also see here listed the component parts and functions and examples of each of these macromolecules. I won't go through all of these right now, but we will be going through all of these macromolecules in separate videos, in videos three and four of this unit. So what are monomers really, and how do they become polymers? And then also how do polymers become monomers? So before we get into this process, I want you to think through the root words involved here. So we just went over macro, see if you can remember what that is, but also what are the root words mono, di, and poly mean? So macro, as I said before, means big, so these macromolecules are big molecules. Um, mono means one, di is two, and poly is many. So when we're talking about monomers becoming polymers, we're talking about small bits becoming larger bits. So what is that process? How does that happen? Well, regardless of what macromolecule we're talking about, it's the same uh, process. So there are two processes here that you need to be familiar with, one in which the monomers are joined together and one in which the monomers are split apart. So the first one in which the monomers are built together is called dehydration synthesis. Let's break down that word. So dehydration means that you take water out. It's like being dehydrated. Right? Synthesis means that things are being built together, coming together. And that's exactly what's happening here. The monomers are being combined when we take water out. So monomers are joined by the removal of the hydroxyl group of one monomer and the removal of a hydrogen from the other at the site of bond formation. And you can see that in that diagram. The OH is removed from one and an H removed from the other, and that's what makes up that H2O. 
after the process, you're left with, um, instead of just two monomers, you're now left with one molecule because they're linked by a covalent bond. So if it's just two components built together, you can call that a dimer. If we continue this process and add more and more monomers, it'll eventually become a polymer. Hydrolysis is the opposite process. Here's where monomers are released by the addition of a water molecule, adding a hydroxyl to one monomer and a hydrogen to the other. So here on the left side of this reaction, you can see that our dimer is in place. The monomers are combined together as a single molecule linked by a covalent bond. And then with the addition of water, it's split up into two monomers. I should point out that just putting a dimer into water is not going to be enough that we need, um, we need an initial input of some energy, and we also need often enzymes. So this is a, a more complicated process. It's not that you can just stick a covalently bonded molecule into water and it'll fall apart. That happens with ionically bonded molecules, or compounds, I should say, but not with um, covalently bonded molecules. So we saw in that last slide that the hydroxyl group was really important in forming that bond when we have dehydration synthesis. So that implies that if we know something about the parts of molecules, it'll help us determine a bit about their behavior. So knowing a bit about structure is going to know, help us learn a bit about function. So take a look at each of these functional groups and see if you can, um, from their structure, uh, have an idea about what their properties might be. As a hint, think about the bond in the molecules within that functional group. So for example, the bond between carbon and hydrogen, how is that different than the bond between oxygen and hydrogen? How might that relate to the properties? So if you look at the properties of each of these functional groups, you'll see that you can actually figure out a lot of these properties from the structure of that functional group. So methyl, for example, which is carbon with three hydrogens on it, is going to be nonpolar. And that's because that carbon-hydrogen bond is nonpolar, or at least nonpolar enough for our purposes. Because carbon and hydrogen have similar enough electronegativity values that there's not a big difference um, between them, and they share those electrons fairly evenly. So that's going to be nonpolar. A hydroxyl, on the other hand, the bond between oxygen and hydrogen is very inequitable in terms of electronegativity. The oxygen has a much higher electronegativity. So that's going to mean that this functional group is polar. So if you have a molecule as a whole with a bunch of hydroxyl molecule or a bunch of hydroxyl functional groups on it, that's going to make that molecule as a whole polar and behave in ways that correspond uh, to being polar. Whereas if you have a molecule that's completely comprised of methyl functional groups, that whole molecule is going to behave in a nonpolar way. You can also then start seeing the behavior of parts of molecules. In some macromolecules, they get large enough that we have to start looking at individual parts of them and how they're behaving. So knowing about the functional groups is going to help us do that. I should point out that the ones with the stars are the ones that I really want you to know. So you should be able to know the structure of each of those star groups. So methyl is CH3, hydroxyl is OH, amino is NH2. This is not just polar, this actually is basic. And what basic means is that it is able to accept an extra hydrogen ion. And so if it um, is capable of accepting it, it's called basic. Carboxyl is the opposite. So carboxyl is acidic, which means it's capable of donating one hydrogen ion. Finally, the phosphate group is P with four O, so that's phosphorus with four oxygens. In this case, this is showing a charged um, version of phosphate. You can see the negative charges on those oxygens. Before it was charged, it had hydrogen ions on there. And so um, if it has hydrogen ions to give away, we call it acidic. Once those hydrogen ions have left, it becomes charged. All right, so let's talk about isomers. Isomers have the same molecular formula, but a different structure. So the question I have for you, if they have the same molecular formula, but a different structure, will they have the same function as one another? Why or why not? 
So even though isomers have the same molecular formula, because they have a different structure, they have a different function in most cases. So remember that there's a connection between structure and function. When the shape of something changes, that impacts its behavior. An example of this is ibuprofen. So there are two isomers of ibuprofen. One is called the R and one is called the S. And this has to do with um, the shape of it. And so these are mirror images of each other. And kind of like your hands are mirror images of each other. And so even though they're structurally, um, or even though their molecular formulas are the same, that difference in structure leads to a difference in function. And so our ibuprofen is not effective, whereas S ibuprofen is an effective analgesic or a um, pain reliever. So we talked about the four major biomolecules, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. Hydrocarbons are not one of those four major biomolecules, um, but they are an important group of molecules. They're composed entirely of hydrogen and carbon. So some examples are methane, ethane, propane, benzene. Um, those names actually have a system of how they're named. It tells you how many carbons they have and whether those carbons have um, all single bonds or there's some double or triple bonds in there. But we're not going to um, worry about that level of detail for right now. But I do want you to be able to recognize hydrocarbons. So um, as practice right now, pick one of those molecules shown in the uh, diagram and determine its molecular formula. Also draw it using skeletal structure. So if you need help with that, a reminder to go back to the first video of this unit where we covered different ways of representing the same molecules. So here you can see the molecular formulas and skeletal structures for each of the hydrocarbons shown. I should point out that methane, it's not really customary to show it as a skeletal structure. Since there's only one carbon, you can't really represent it as an end or a bend. Um, but the other ones, you can see um, the, the representation for the skeletal diagrams is pretty simple. It's just a series of lines. So we'll leave it here for this video. I'm going to try to make these videos a little bit shorter, easier to digest. So we'll stop here for today.